All right, so here we are at uh, in Cape Town uh, in Newlands, right by Tail Mountain National Park, um, and we've got Alessandro from very far away uh, <laughs> in in the living room. This is just rewild dialogues where we look to just sort of unpack uh, various uh, conversations and innovation regarding sustainability and conservation. So, welcome, Alessandro. Thanks, thanks, Sam. It's been, uh, yeah, quite quite a good time here in South Africa, like being so close to nature. You know, we in Europe uh, live in cities where, where there's a lot of distance from like wilder places. So, I mean, we had just an experience in the Kruger. For, of course, was intense, but even like here in Cape Town, um, the wild is sort of like taking over urban spaces, which is great to, to, to experience and see. Um, so yeah, I'm excited about this conversation. I think we'll be covering a lot, uh, a lot of the discussions we had in the past days. We try to summarize them in, in this in this dialogue. Um, I'm very excited to explore uh, with you uh, since you've just uh, been nominated or you just uh, started working in in in, in rewild Africa in, in innovation. So I think we can talk about technology innovation and what it means for conservation and and uh, the protection of nature in, in some way and us as humans. So yeah, very much looking forward. Great, Ale. Um, yeah, just to uh, bring some sort of uh, context to our listeners, uh, me and Ale met uh, whilst yeah, I guess even just searching. Uh, you know, I think through Schumacher College, we mm -hmm. had a like a mutual uh, contact who I used to go to school with. He was five years older than me. His name is Sean is Jacobs uh, at Sachs High School, which is actually just down the road from here. Um, and we struck up a conversation. I mean, your surname is Mazzi, right? It's yeah. Alessandro Mazzi. Yeah. Uh, so you're Italian. I'm Italian. Um, living in the Netherlands for now, what is it, six or seven years, uh, mostly in the tech uh, blockchain space my background is in public uh, international law so um, but a, a very um, I would say eclectic sort of experience and and, and, and wor work experience uh, working in the field of law uh, business and technology especially the what we call now web 3 which is the decentralized internet uh, I've been working in the field for quite a while yeah but originally Italian from Verona moved to the Netherlands as, you know, Amsterdam, especially the tech hub of Europe, one of the biggest tech hub in Europe, has been exciting. But um, in recent years, I've been trying to connect more with the wilder environment and trying to get inspiration for the technology that we want to build from, from nature. So, um, yeah, and this is why also I joined the Sovereign Nature Initiative around a year and a, and a half ago um, attracted by the questions that uh, the founders of Soil Nature were asking, you know, like how can we value uh, nature and the environment and the living more uh, alive than that, right? Like because the economic model that we find ourselves in seems to be incentivizing extraction, exploitation of nature uh, and valuing that more than that being the nature being thriving. So one of the questions that was Super interesting for me was was that you know, and Sovereign Nature Initiative was trying to tackle that um, through the use of technology with this new decentralized tech. They saw the potential uh, and they, they decided to invest um, uh, money into this initiative that tries to. Um, one of the main focuses is to develop technology in service to nature, um, giving nature a voice. Uh, giving nature uh, an identity so to be able to act in, you know, uh, 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 more than human economics in some way. Okay, so, yeah, so s that, that sort of brought me to my next question, which is really, what is the Sovereign Nature Initiative? And I think you've, you've briefly described there, but if, if there's anything else that you would like to kind of explain around the why uh, it, it kind of came out into being, is there any sort of story Sure. Um, and um, well, we are we are a um, um, non for profit based in Amsterdam. Um, the Sovereign Nature Initiative was funded in twenty nineteen by uh, three founders: uh, Ewald Hesse, Andrea Leiter, and Florian Schmidt. 
uh, and basically came emerged as from conversations between these three. Uh, Evald is a, a technology entrepreneur in the Web three since uh, since the prehistoric times. Um, Andrea Leiter is an associate professor at the University of Amsterdam, and then um, uh, Florian Smith is a director, art director. Uh, so from those three uh, conversations, from you know the, the technology perspective to the the academic more uh, rigorous uh, approach of Andrea, looking at like how we did relate to nature in the past and what kind of economic models we used and how, you know, capitalism in some way has always been dominating, not just, you know, um, uh, a human hierarchy in some way, but also an hierarchy with, with nature. And, uh, and then the creative side of, of Florian was uh, pretty much bringing like art, and experiences into the picture, and like seeing like how, you know, art and uh, experiences in, in in nature can help um, humans reconnect with the, the the natural environment. So, with these three different ingredients, so art and experience, thinking and knowledge, and then um, technology, uh, somehow sovereign nature emerged. Um, so this is the story. Right now, we are um, mostly focused on uh, the technology development, and some academic research is uh, starting. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, community development is also an activity that we're doing right now. So trying to develop um, uh, a, a community of technologists, artists, designers that work in, uh, towards you know building new economic model, new technologies that are in service of uh, nature. It's something that it feels we've never really done in the past. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a brief introduction of no, what that's, nature is. That's a really good introduction. And, you know, at, um, at Rewild Africa, you know, we, we're, we're, we're storytellers that uh, kind of try to bridge, um, uh, bridge the link between science and innovation to become more digestible to uh, a greater to the greater public, you know, what is interesting, what is being highlighted in terms of, you know, the, the, one of the best solutions to ecological restoration or to mitigate for climate change or to adapt to climate change. Uh, I think decentralized finance and the space of Web3 is going to play a massive role in, in the space mm -hmm. of, of, of really giving space and room to solving that problem where it's, you know, that idea of decentralization is, you know, we see it in the natural world. We see the ability for mycelium and nutrients to pass through an ecosystem much more effectively or information flow much more effectively through through nature we we know this um and and you know the more that we kind of i guess have a relationship with technology in a way that could help us engage with nature in a way that's going to benefit both us and nature mm. is something that is of deep interest at least to myself and and to the way in which rewild africa asks the questions like what is some of the best solutions. And I think maybe just to dive a little bit deeper, you know, what is your understanding of Web3? How is it different to the other webs? And, uh, you know, Web1, Web2? And, you know, just in layman's terms, like how would mm. you describe mm. it? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to, to me, Web3 is also like, it just fits perfectly in the times it, it, it came at a, uh, at a time where we need uh, decentralized decision making, uh, you know, what someone, some people call collective intelligence. Like we see, uh, you know, that uh, governments and institutions are struggling to deal with the complexity of the world, uh, of a world that is continuously changing, um, that needs different perspective to be integrated. So what Web3 does is connects uh, individuals, you know, for now it's only humans, but uh, one of the things that sovereign nature is excited about is like to create these interspecies connections as well, so that the perspective of other species and non-humans can also be heard, right? But uh, back to your question, what, what Web3 does to me, what means to me very much is like, it connects people without any center of power mediating that relationship and interaction. And that will change, you know, how we deal with transaction exchanges of resources, exchanges of knowledge, 
um, um, uh, support, so supporting each other, like uh, the old DeFi, you know, which is still like a very, very, very early stage, but it has a lot of potential. DeFi means decentralized finance, which means I don't have to go to a bank to ask for funding. I can access that funding from crowds of people that are willing to, to, to you know, um, borrow money to each other or finance certain projects that they believe in in a very, again, decentralized, very open uh, way without much, you know, uh, paperwork to be done and, and, you know, trust can be built uh, from, the, from a transparent ledger and network. Um, so yeah, this this is what to me the the, the most you know the, the potential of of, of Web three uh, really uh, stands stands on is, is like connecting uh, people without any mediation with very uh, a low uh, friction and uh, and again like for sovereignty initiative the, in, the interesting part comes when we actually integrate also nature, we, when we can give nature a voice. So the idea of the Internet of Things for us is uh, the Internet of uh, inter interspecies, you know, the Internet of the more than humans, the non-humans, it's something that we're exploring. And it sounds very utopian, but when you start to look into actually applying it, it, it starts to make sense. And it's part of like this, what, you know, some call like, uh, new consciousness in some way that is, you know, not uh, human-centric but ecocentric, where, you know, humans and uh, the rest of the world are seen as, as, as uh, at the same, uh, being at the same level, right? Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, thanks, Ale. I think what would be really useful is, and I mean, I think the capitalist economy and the way in which we've had a relationship with the natural world um, you know, it's without a question that that kind of relationship needs to be innovated or changed or mm -hmm. uh, built in, in a way that uh, has, you know, rewilding doesn't mean, you know, just rewilding a landscape with with species or rewilding it with, uh, you know, agriculture with new forms of of tree planting or um, etc. You know, like, of course, you know, the, those are, that is physical rewilding, but the re, re, the real rewilding is also just that kind of connection with with the human um, and how we are engaged psychologically with nature mm -hmm. um, and I think that there's there's also a little bit of a like how we evolve uh, into with technology in a way that connects us more with nature mm -hmm. because sometimes it maybe on the surface level doesn't feel that way because technology sometimes is a barrier between us and nature and it'll be so interesting to see where it it helps us actually see more value in nature and connect further with nature. You know, I think I read about it a little bit in that in species money, being able to understand artificial intelligence and being able to understand data at a high level to understand how biodiversity is thriving for an ecosystem and really helping us with data collection uh, and just understanding where, where an ecosystem is at. So, I mean, just, just, just to the point where, just to the statement, I think it was Ralph, was it Ralph Shami? Mm. You said that, you know, sp spoke about, like, how do we see something more valuable alive than dead? Sure. And how, wh what, what does that mean to you? And, and how, how is it, how might the Sovereign Nature Initiative be tackling that idea? Yeah, uh, we, I mean, uh, value is something that I think, <laughs> at least personally, I've, I've always struggled to, to, to find because as soon as you quantify it into a number, it's already limiting the experience to someone else and, and how they value, right? Like you, you quantify something that is qualitative in nature. So it's, it's hard for, it's a very hard question for us. So let's say right now we, so we, we value nature from how much we can extract from it. Um, there is hope in this new, uh, which I think is a transitionary period of, uh, you know, looking at ecosystem services and the whole carbon market. Like, it's a new way, at least we're not killing the planet. Like, it's, it's a way for us to value it enough, to value it more uh, alive than that, so that we can actually protect it within the existing capitalist system. To me, the future um, 
should be you know about not development of of uh, I mean development of technology for sure, but also development of 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 people's relationship with the environment. It should be expanding to include everything else, which means. Uh, looking at intrinsic value, you know, and what deep ecology talks about in terms of um, nature as value in itself, uh, you know, without, uh, you know, having to calculate the benefits that we get from it, you know, it, it has intrinsic value. And I think uh, people, individuals, communities realizing that and acting without, you know, um, asking always everything, uh, anything in return, I think is is the way I I personally like to see the future um, and I think uh, you know Les and I were also very much interested into that so um, Andrea Evald and Florian the founders of SNI call it the flipping the economics so this is what mm -hmm. I was talking about like looking at re revaluing nature more from being alive than dead and we believe that that's somehow the paradigm shift in some way where we could talk start talking about like capitalism being in service to nature at some point you know um, but again I don't see that as like the, any any sort of like solution you know it's it's a transition it's something that will make us transition it's something that will make us uh, you know challenge the 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 destructive uh, pattern that we are into and just change it. Um, but it won't be, uh, in my personal opinion, the, the, the future the future should be a change in our uh, you know perspective uh, of the world that is ecocentric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's really, I guess, um, yeah, so that's really seeing ourselves in relationship with the natural world. I mean, biodiversity is the amounts of species or genetic variability of, bi of, you know, of nature in, in a certain ecosystem. And that has intrinsic value in itself, you know, like the, so yeah, uh, you know, Table Mountain has more species of, of, uh, of plant species than apparently the whole of the United Kingdom, you know, just on this mountain, you know, and that, that we, you know, we can't, we can't, when we lose a species, you know, we can't really just bring it back, you know, and I think that this, that this idea is, 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 is both a sad one, like something, you know, just from a, like an emotional perspective, um, if you are never like growing up to, to see the intrinsic value of a bird in your, in, in, like in your garden, if you, if you, if, if your father or a friend or a colleague or a mentor just says, that is a Cape sugar bird. You know, and there it is. You know, have a look at it. It's sucking from the nectar of, of that erica plant. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just being there and having a like that relationship and that connection with that bird might m make you want to conserve it in the future. Because in the if you just read in the newspaper one day that we've lost a species of bird, what does it really matter if we have no connection? Yeah, to to biodiversity, and I think and I think in terms of like value, you know, focusing on one species, one species is valuable, of course, but the relationship that the species have with everything else around it. So you 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 mentioned biodiversity. Um, I think value. If we start to value non-humans, we should start valuing the relationships. You know, the 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 bigger picture, the holistic picture about you know how an ecosystem works and, and how, you know, different species, animals, plants, the soil, the atmosphere, how these all work out around and like looking at the complexity of it. And if we try to value that and how unique this, you know, how non-fungible, you know, these, these relationships are, I think any attempt to evaluate that, it's like, uh, it will probably fall short in some mm. way. Yeah. Like, so, um, if we if we have to understand that, like, and you know it, uh, if we take a, a species out of its ecosystem, it would change all the rest of like the health of all the the, the ecosystem, all the other species that are part of it. So we should also, um, I think, with with you know with with 
uh, your project at Protectors, like he's trying to look at like this bigger uh, picture in terms of like how we perceive uh, nature, not focusing on I individual species, but focusing on the relationship between them and the relationship with us. So I'm super excited and uh, I wish I had more knowledge and experience on this uh, community-led conservation and how, you know, uh, communities being part of the ecosystem with other species can actually help the, the conservation of, of uh, you know, beautiful wild places. Mm. So I wanted to maybe, you know, uh, before we get into my tech, I want to, to, for you to maybe summarize for the listeners of what is community led conservation and maybe share some of your experiences, you know, being with, with communities that live with wilder places and, you know. Yeah, I think it's the, it's the most important story within this debate, within this conversation of, of biodiversity conservation. You know, people are at the center of it. Protects is the docu-series that we're looking to build, uh, is going to be looking at, you know, um, the guardians of these ecosystems, people that live on the edge, who are protecting them every single day. And, you know, there's science related to those, bi those species, such as a forest elephant, which captures a lot of carbon. But at the end of the day, you know, these people that live on the peripheries of these forests, you know, need to make an income, they need to feed their children. And uh, at the end of the day, they don't benefit. They, well, some, they're either beneficiaries of a project in conservation or they don't benefit at all. And I, I think just to go a little bit deeper into that, there's a stakeholder and there's a beneficiary. And the stakeholder is someone who has access to the decisions of how the land is mm -hmm. looked after. So you know, a like a steward, yeah. like a steward of the land. And a beneficiary is someone who might just be on the land, but we working in tourism on the land and is benefiting from the, from the tourism, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make that sort of dis distinction. And, and in conservation in general, a lot of indigenous people have been beneficiaries in conservation efforts, you know. Uh, and I think, I think like with, with just the space that I've seen in trying to elevate the role of communities in conservation, you know, the OECM, other affected areas-based conservation measures, has been the most interesting, otherwise known as OECMs. Mm -hmm. It's quite a long acronym, but um, it's, it, that for me has been the most exciting space in terms of having a relationship between uh, community and biodiversity. Mm -hmm. It's where, where, I mean, this project was just looking at, a, at how do rangelands and grass species can coexist. Rangelands like cattle mm -hmm. um, outside the Kruger National Park. Uh, the example is actually Dixie community outside um, the Kruger National Park where they've managed to create a, a, like new strategies to be able to move the cattle in such a way that would also preserve the, the integrity of the grass species, mm -hmm. the biodiversity of grass, because there's a lot more types of grass uh, in that ecosystem and you know if you move them in a particular way you can conserve a lot more of the species that exist at a kind of more foundational ground level as well as finding a way for the community to benefit um, and then there's a lot of uh, potential economic developments that come from that you know there's a company called meat naturally that has been in relationship to this and i think like it's a very big conversation because you're also talking about culture here mm -hmm. you know a lot of people and vegan veganism and vegetarianism and, and and like are fighting for the rights of like moving towards that you know sometimes it's siloed in their own echo chamber of what really sure. a solution looks like because a culture might be um might be cattle and in africa it's been a big pastime and they've like grown with cattle all their life so changing that culture is actually uh it's not the solution yeah. at least at that point so that, that's just an example from an ecological perspective. And there is, yeah, and there is, sorry to interrupt, but no. there, is a, there is a lineage, there is a history of these communities living with the species, living with the wild, living with their own also uh, uh, bred animals. Like, and then us, us meaning Europeans or Americans, uh, Westerners coming to these communities and tell them like, well, we're going to fence your, uh, uh, you know, your your farm and exclude you from an environment that you've been dealing with for the past, like, I don't know, thousands of years, you know, thousands of years. Um, I think that's not the solution in conservation. Um, we need to tackle first 
the separation between you know nature and humans and like if we try to go to communities and and separate them from you know what happened in the in Yellowstone and I think in the Kruger it's to certain certain extent we we excluded people from nature in some way um, so I think where technology you know could be helpful there is to is to is to rebuild these relationships you know so like from you know monitoring predators coming close to your farm and like giving signals to like just facilitating the 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 rewilding of communities or rewilding of of humans um in, in such a way that the relationship becomes harmonious and becomes more balanced you know because yeah. we are part of it yeah you know we we have been changing landscape ourselves like an elephant does for you know thousands of years um, the, I was talking to a scientist that works in the Amazon forest and she was telling me how, um, what is the word, anthropogenic the Amazon is, uh, which means like how much humans and indigenous uh, people living in the Amazon actually um, facilitated the biodiversity of the, of, of, the, of the Amazon rainforest because of the seeds that they were bringing around and you know the mm -hmm. just just the impact they had as as animals you know <laughs> i mean because we are as animals in the amazon so excluding people thinking like they were only destructive species in this planet or you know some say they were invasive species i'd never like that's just nonsense to me mm. Uh, our thinking needs, needs to change our culture needs to change our economic system needs to change but um, we are part of, uh, you know, of nature, and mm. nature is part of us. And, and yeah, you know. and tech is like the facilitator. It's not a, a means to an end. Tech, it's mm. like mm. the mm. contributing factor that might help us engage with that. Because I think from, you know, just to go back to that kind of community-led conservation uh, strategies. You know, like we 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 have to literally answer that question. And not and and the elephants in the room is that there haven't been stakeholders. Communities haven't been stakeholders in landscape in Africa since colonialism. If we're not answer, if we're not breaking through that wall, you know, and answering that question, I I also don't think that we we're going to solve it because it goes back to the 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 bird in the in, that we connect with. You mm. know, um, if they don't have a relationship with the land then as a stakeholder, at least you have a relationship with the land. And that's what we really need. We just need people being able to engage with landscape in a way, again, where they become stewards. You know? And African people, they know the land. They know the flow of the land, you know, I guess, more than our Western perspective, which is, which is less. Um, so answering the question of how, how do people, indigenous communities become stakeholders in landscape? And... and, and 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 also saying like more resources going to to the rewilding of a particular megafauna like elephants in the ecosystem they can't feel they mustn't be able to feel like there's more attention and money resources going into the elephant conservation than the community because that's not going to solve the problem either you know I heard a story the other day I don't know where it was from but you know it made the community very angry when you know all this money is going into relocating an elephant mm -hmm. but you know, um, someone got very sick in the, in the in the community just next to the elephant, and help only came two days later. And so that that social like ec that social ecological crisis there is something that we need to find the link Absolutely. towards. And I, but I do believe, you know, obviously we need so now we bring in a more like macro sy systems level perspective when what the earth needs now is being able to regulate and mitigate or adapt to climate change. So mitigation is going to be hard, but adaption is going to be like, uh, you know, from the research, a way in which we can engage with the problems sure. that we're facing, adaption. Uh, and it's going to be very, I think, very, very locally contextual adaption to climate adaptation. change. Adaptation. That's yeah. the word. Uh, yeah. Sure, absolutely. Word. I, believe, I believe so. And, and adaptation doesn't have to mean like, the crazy compromises that we have to we will have to make I mean not compromises just like let go of certain stuff that we got used to and comfortable with but also adapting our own again thinking and way of experiencing uh, you know nature and technology it's part of that adaptation 
Yeah. And, or, and, you know. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think, so I, I mentioned it quite a few times, like, you know, the problem of, like, the human thinking differently than nature does in some way. I mean, that though, you know, consciousness ar arose from nature. It's like it didn't, it just was plucked from the universe somewhere, I guess. This is my belief. <laughs> um, so there's something very fascinating to me, and something that you guys are working on with Learn Biomimicry is like, how can deep observation of nature and understanding through science as well um, help us build better, design better technology models, econ economics, like uh, this is fascinating to me and I would like you maybe to briefly introduce biomimicry and what you believe is the, you know, it's, is that innovation for, you know, and is biomimicry innovation yeah. to you? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, just to introduce biomimicry, I mean, biomimicry in my experience is, is a tool, you know, that we can use, like, if, just to explain what biomimicry, biomimicry is learning from nature, not, uh, sorry, learning from, na yeah, learning from nature, not just about nature. So I can tell you about that bird and what it likes to eat and the scientific name behind it, but learning from nature would be like, you know, how, like, how it captures the nectar. Uh, in with its beak, you know, and specifically to go through the petals and collect it, or how it flies, like learning about its aerodynamicness, or um, how it works in the system, or looking at process. So, biomimicry is just a long word for just sitting down and observing nature and understanding its efficiencies and understanding how it evolved in this world, much like we did, you know. Some of the species that are here have been for a year a lot longer than us, you know, mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of the, the problems that we, we're looking to solve exist outside, and we just need to think outside the box, which is outside, and engage with nature, and so, you know, by, but at the end of the day, it's a tool, you know, and you can use a tool in whatever way you want, if you think about a hammer, you know, you can build a house with a hammer, or you can break a house with a hammer, so what's your intention there, what is your intrinsic value behind learning from nature? That's very important, which mm -hmm. is ethos and reconnect. Yes, yes. And it's just something I want to bring up because that's what I'm really passionate about. You know, it's no point learning biomimicry when you don't, have, when you haven't built an, an ethics and a value system around how we live and engage with nature, you know, mm -hmm. um, rather than just seeing a way to mimic and create an efficiency that works well in a capitalist mindset and earn a lot of money. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, but, and I think from a technological perspective, it's going to help us engage with efficiencies if you just think about how a forest is engaging with you know waste you know, how does our cities engage with waste in, in a particular in a, in a way that's like that mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um, if you think about how a spider uh, you know uh, builds its web very very strong web it doesn't use heat beat or treat like we do to create these metals or things it literally does it within you know the degree, however hot it is in its abdomen, in the stomach of the spider, you know, there's just so much innovation that's already mm -hmm. right here. And I think like being able to find that circular, you know, this is where the circular economy obviously is coming in, coming in, being able to understand, you know, the waste of something that goes into a forest, the, tr the leaves that fall, that fall back into the energy system of a tree. How is that happening right now with, for example, waste in our city how is the energy the methane re released from all the all the food products that we eat potentially being captured and reused mm -hmm. within the system you know it's it's moving away from this type of economics which is quite linear uh, moving and moving towards one that is non-linear that has interactions much like the web of life of biodiversity mm -hmm. and feeding back into those systems so yeah i guess and and you know we've engaged you know, with a company called Learn Biomimicry, which is foundational online learning courses that introduce the concepts of biomimicry, as I've just mm -hmm. kind of kind of looked at now, and then the life principles, which is actually my favorite. I actually have it on my wall in my room, which are like the, the biomimicry life principles, and there's so many things you can take from those principles that you can apply to your everyday mm -hmm. life. You know, I do that, mm -hmm. thinking, thinking about that. Yeah, and like, I... I um you know, I brought this up quite often to startups. I, you know, I asked the questions on like, what is, what is your limit in terms of like growth? 
you know, and like most of them, uh, you know, said that my limit is more, you know, like this like uh, <laughs> growth oriented sort of uh, answers. And I said like, why don't you just look at like how a tree grows and develops. So grow, growth and development to me are very different. Like growth is about quantity and development, it's about qualities emerging. A tree grows until you know, it's ready to give fruit and then it starts just giving and it reaches this steady state where it's just like part of a web of other trees supporting, you know, the, the surrounding environment and spreading its seeds so that, you know, new trees can grow. That's to me what, what you know, uh, a company should be, a startup should be, a community should be, you know, should grow to, to the point where it can start serving others and it doesn't have to continuously extract nutrients from the, the surrounding environment and capitalism is just doing that um, continuous extraction from uh, you know a, a finite planet which is abundant of course but it's not it, it, it has some limits on the capacity it can you know regenerate so that's to me you know uh, that's that is to me biomimicry as well in terms of like economic models you know like it's it's we have to learn from nature because we are any economic model that we build will have consequences on the environment mm. because uh, because we use its resources you know we are part of it we we you know create waste and, and so on so um, yeah I think any like technological solutions that uh, that we will build has to be informed by that that you know first experience of nature and then uh, nature bound you know thinking in some mm -hmm. way um, yeah so I think like what what you know uh, at sovereign nature we're extremely uh, excited uh, excited about is uh, this new like thinking uh, beyond species and you know uh, seeing species as like some separate things and more you know looking at entanglements and how relationships can you know be valued and represented uh, um, in you know in economic models in um, in technology like so how can you give an identity to an ecosystem for instance right and being able Do you to have an example of that um, we haven't uh, developed anything in terms of like evaluation of ecosystems yet, um, but um, we're definitely uh, moving towards working into like giving identity to species, individual uh, animals and plants. Uh, so being able to map all of that and then trying to see what is the flow of, for instance, carbon between you know, the different actors uh, on, on, in an ecosystem. This is something that we've been uh, just like thinking about, you know, uh, and looking at like what kind of technology are available yet to allow us to do that, you know, like, so yeah. again, Web3, um, being able to uh, access uh, GIS data from the top, being able to, uh, you know, access data from uh, remote sensing and also like data from citizen science, so trying to get as much information as we can from an ecosystem and then being able to combine it so that it makes sense, <laughs> you know, that it tells us something valuable. Um, this is, yeah, uh, these are things that we have, uh, uh, we're looking into very deeply in the technologies that we've built. I totally, I totally, totally get that. I, I think like being able to, well, that <laughs> I genuinely get excited because we are now like being able to pay more attention to data, you know, and, and information flows through technology, the relationship with technology, you know, the emergence of innovative based tech companies that have an ethos and a value system, you know, they've, they've gone through the why they need to connect with nature, you know, and then, but also being able to map and collect data, whether it's on, you know, biodiversity, the number of species per landscape. I think there's Open Forest Protocol, mm -hmm. who Open Forest who are doing really cool work and just having mapping systems and, mm -hmm. and knowing the projects that are happening around the world. You know, like where technology is going to be able to give us real-time data on the flow of carbon in an ecosystem. 
or the influence that an elephant has in an ecosystem, a particular elephant, you know, how much carbon is it storing because of its existence, you know, in the, in the forests of Gabon, you know? mm-hmm. information on a whale that's, um, and, you know, the impact in terms of carbon that it has, you know, not, not to put the lens too deeply on, on carbon, because I, I do believe that that is, um, that is a little bit, uh, short sighted actually, when we just look at the carbon conversation, because this, it's very complex, but I think, Technology uh, gives is going to give us potentially this connection, you know, with AI, you know, and 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 this space to really engage with the problem at hand, to to adapt, mm-hmm. um, to mitigate yeah. the the impacts. And I think that there's a huge business model that's that's growing in those spaces. And w- what would you say to uh, a young person, uh, you know, that's just leaving university now? Uh, that like is interested in tech but also interested in nature like wh- what would you say to them to engage with you know rewilding and, um, mm-hmm. and, and tech yeah I think the first thing I would say which just just you know always worked for me is just get get out there get out in the wild for for a certain amount of time that is you know meaningful enough for you to have a the deep 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 experience with nature um but from that you know then go into an exploration go go learn about how any how you know uh, ecology works how biodiversity works how um you know everything is basically alive from rocks to to you know uh Schumacher to, college type yeah, yeah to monkeys to like to humans and how our thinking informs you know our thinking and, and what is the difference between you know abstraction that humans have capacity and other animals and what is it what are the consequences of that like i think uh, a deep exploration about like what is the human role in the larger you know web of life it's very important it's been very helpful for me and then you start building technology you know like but you have to go through that you have to go through that experience and that type of like thinking and and you know uh, ref- reflection mm. before you commit and start building then it seems that we did you know in the loop we did the other way around we started building and then as soon as like you know we we thought that like technology would just solve things and then we jump on building from the start without having a proper understanding of like what is tools what are tools and what are tools that we've developed in the in you know the history of humanity and um and what are the mistakes we made and how can we build you know finally some technology that is in service of nature and us you know i'm nature and is including us mm. yeah i made reference there to schumacher college which is uh, uh obviously a place that we're both very interested in that houses a lot of the thought and and the knowledge around guy theory and deep ecology and system thinking and complexity theory which is all very useful i think it's all online as well though to be able to engage with that content and as you said mm-hmm. like just being able to directly experience nature again and form a relationship with it I totally agree is, is like one way in which we can engage with it. And, and lastly, like I think like you, if, if, if there's anything that an individual has in this world, it's a value system that you can hold, you know, like creating meaningful relationships where you know that, you know, you know, whether it's your partner, whether it's the, your, your co-founders of a business, uh, whether it's people you study with, you know, try and I think, um, engage with people that have the same value system as you as you do because then you'll start building products and services around a, a very strong foundation you know I think that that's just been a successful thing at rewild Africa for us is we all have a very strong value system for nature and we all agree with like certain things and that's been very helpful with with growing and I think like ask yourself what are your values you know what do you what do you what is what is important for you in the world um and that's the most important foundation that anyone can do before starting a career going into a career um you know even if you coming towards a, a new experience in life you know um going to schumacher college mm-hmm. um facilitating an immersion in, in in the wild 
and reading all these papers, you know, interspecies money, which I think is very interesting. And I think where and why I brought this up uh, is because if you know that you value these things, we have to put our money where our mouth is. At least I'm speaking to myself here. Mm-hmm. If you know that, if you know that we need megafauna, large uh, herbivores on on ecos in ecosystems, you know we need to put money behind projects that is going to conserve that. Why? Because we want our children to have a world that is also thrivable. You know, climate change is going to change the environment, and we we can't deny the the science anymore that it's changing. I'm not saying that megafauna reintroduction is the solution, but it's a solution. You know, if another one is new forms of agriculture, agroforestry, that's mm-hmm. going to be regenerative on the soil. Let's put our money there and let's change the narrative of where the pension funds are because pension funds mm-hmm. are locked and they're safe and they're looking after the kind of the, the interest of the capitalist economy. And the capitalist economy is not going to let go. They're not going to go. It's going to go down as an angry child, you know. Um, yeah. So I, I just want to make that point around like if we know these things, Let's start putting our value that we have towards projects that are regenerative. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. that you know where tech is collecting data on biodiversity in a specific ecosystem, understanding like a community and what their needs are, and building them into uh, a finance model that makes them like you know makes them healthy and happy and connected. I'm not going to say, and you know, it could be quite naive and ignorant in saying that, but those are the sort of levels of curiosity and intention I think we need to put into the world with with, with regards to the relationship we have with biodiversity and tech. Yeah. Because we won't exist in this world in the future if we don't have biodiversity. So. Absolutely, yeah. And I think, like, just to, to riff and, and conclude on your... Uh, yeah. A beautiful presentation of like you know why you know the fact that money should go into into this i believe uh like investing in in nature investing in 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 biodiversity in something that it's, it's such a resilient system i don't see anything like safer than that you know mm-hmm. um safer for for your present uh, you know, uh, financial resources, but also for the future. Like, look at yourself as like, yeah, um, it's an investment now. Yeah, you yeah. can, you can. We need to speak to that world that there's potentially an investment in yeah. that. Yeah, and I think that rather that's, than it being you know, a nice to have yeah. or a or a philanthropy of let's look after nature. Sure, sure. It should be something that is mutually beneficial. Exactly. So that's also again something that. Uh, SNI is deeply looking into, you know. Um, I think conservation is struggling because of this uh, not being able to maintain itself and having like a business model that is, again, sustainable. Um, or business, I mean, just a model that, that makes it, uh, you know, makes the funding and funding resources easy mm. in some way. Um, so, yeah, I think... We believe that Web3, since we, we have the knowledge, we have the, 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 the understanding of the technology, has the potential to bring investment and, and, and money into uh, conservation, protection of nature, rewilding, regenerative mm-hmm. uh, sort of um, uh, activities. And yeah, Great. Well, <laughs> it's been awesome to be in, in conversation yeah, with you, This is great. Some rewild dialogues. <laughs> um, and yeah, I just highly encourage everyone to engage with the Sovereign Nature Initiative. You can check out their websites and check out their social media links on LinkedIn. Yeah. Reach out to Alessandro. Um, yeah, you and can reach out to me for partnerships and uh, anyone yeah. that is interested in learning Hackathons. more about Sure, sure. And all the, the activities that we do in community development, technology development, uh, you know, uh, events. Uh, and the type of art that we engage with, uh, please reach out. I mean, there's uh, um, there's a lot that we're busy with, and and a lot of conversations that we need to have with as many people as we can in the field of conservation to understand what what uh, nature needs right now. And, mm. You know. Yeah, and and I mean, and and just from our side, you know, protectors is the documentary series that we, you know, we. At the moment, going through the the, the research and and um, uh, kind of the early stage 
of the documentary series, which we were so excited to be building. Um, we're building a pilot now to potentially fund, you know, uh, us going and telling the story of the forest elephants mm-hmm. and the role that the communities have uh, there with the forest elephant, as well as the importance of that elephant in sequestering carbon. They huge. They have a massive role in in those uh, Central African forests, uh, rainforests. So. Um, that's really exciting and, and if that kind of project engages anyone you know reach out to to rewild africa if you think there's a, a character or there's a landscape or there's a story you're relating to you know uh, bringing back um, megafauna or specific eco uh, specific species back into ecosystems but also there's a potential community-based story surrounding a species you know rewild africa would love to learn about it and engage further with with storytelling related to the protection of those ecosystems and the guardians of them. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for the conversation and thank you. So yeah, all the best with sovereign nature initiative and yeah, yeah. thanks so much. Thanks.